So yeah, I start and they put me in a cubicle away from everybody else. And the same guy that came down that gave me the 50 cents towards my offer, the, the GM of sales, has three phone books like stacked this high. And he drops them on my cubicle desk and he says, hit the phones, I'll fire you as quickly as I hired you. Make something happen. And I was like, oh, wow. All right, game on. Thanks for tuning into The Windwire. Today we have the podcast debut of Alex Verrill. Alex and I first met when he was running Americas at Zscaler. And when he left to take on the chief revenue officer role at Multiverse, I knew it was time to have him on. We talk about the deals that changed his career, his unique background breaking into the industry after studying English and theater in college, and his philosophies on building high-performing teams in high-stakes environments. He really brought to life what it takes to distinguish oneself and the importance of resilience and adaptability in leadership. Without further ado, Alex Farrell. Alex, welcome to The Windwire. Thank you. Hi, Michael. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I, uh, I'm Good. excited to talk to, I mean, we were connected a bunch of years ago by Dolly over at Zscaler when you were still there. I knew I wanted to pick your brain back then. Then we talked before this podcast even existed. You mentioned you were a black belt in internal wind wires, but you know, then for some reason we started this and it seems like we're the first podcast who's been able to get you on. Well, the, yes. Yeah. No, I don't, I mean, uh, Fair point. I talked to Joe Rogan. I politely declined multiple times. I think I'd mentioned this to you before. I just, I'm, I'm a fan of so many of these great people, so many great people that are out there that I've actually worked with and then folks that I haven't worked with, but I've heard about. And um, I, I, you know, appreciate the opportunity to learn from them and rather than me taking the stage, but, you know, I, uh, I appreciate the rapport that we've developed. So here we are and I'm grateful for the, for the opportunity. Yeah, of course. No, look, you're a trendsetter. You know, you wouldn't just go to the the mainstream thing. But um, but in all <laughs> seriousness, to your point, I uh, I do think that's what makes life and and some of this work really fascinating. Is everyone has something or many things that are interesting to share based on what they've seen. And if you don't work with someone directly, or you haven't made them as a friend already, you would never know that. You've obviously had some incredible experiences throughout your career, which there's still plenty of room to go. Um, excited to delve into at least two of them that we talked about beforehand. And I know the first one was working in Spanish language broadcast television, uh, where you talk about deals. To close well, yeah, we'll talk about deals in a second, but I, I think, okay. you know, I, I am curious about that journey. As far as I know, you don't have any Mexican roots personally. Uh, I'd love to hear about just in general, how you found your career after you know childhood, academia, how you kind of got to that place, you know, overall. Okay. Okay. All right, again, I'm gonna, I'll give it to you, but I'm going to preface this. I, I, I don't know if it's like uh, over-rotation on humility or imposter syndrome. I'm just fascinated by other people's stories. Um, I certainly have one, but um, I, again, I, there's so much to learn from, from other people, but here we go. All right, so as a kid, um, I was very entrepreneurial. I was enterprising. I was plotting. I was scheming. It was just in my DNA. It was in my blood. Um, both grandfathers were... Um, uh, business people, entrepreneurs, I mean, and they were really great about including me in these conversations at dinner tables and just letting me be a fly on the wall. So, um, you know, as a kid, I was buying and reselling used Nintendo games in the hallway um, of, of my school. I would go um, to any garage sale and offer to work at a garage sale if I could just be part of the transactions. I mean, I, I, on and on and on and on. In high school, I, I worked for a company that did copies litigation copies, like physical copies on a Xerox machine to prepare trial lawyers for trials so they can have binders of all the exhibits and documents and, and all of that. So it's just in my blood. Um, and so I go to school and I, I have this phone call with my dad and I let him know that I'm no longer an economics major. Um, are you seated, dad? Yes, I'm seated. I'm gonna be an English major. And he's, yeah, what, what the hell is going on? What, what restaurant are you going to work at when you graduate? I don't, I don't understand. And, um, and he, you know, I, I think in so many ways kind of challenged me or put, put a, an additional chip on my shoulder to go out and um, finish that academic part of my life and then figure out how applicable and practical it was in the real world. And when I got back from college as an English major, um, and a theater minor, 
Um, <laughs> I was a theater, a Spanish minor for two years. And then I made another phone call and I was like, hey, albeit I'm probably 90% fluent by this point, I'm going to go ahead and drop that and I'm going to, I'm going to cut over as a theater minor. Um, and I think he was probably double alarmed. But so I have that Spanish language background, again, just out of curiosity and being a native Texan. That was something as a kid that was interesting to me. So I started taking Spanish lessons as a kid. Um, I love the culture, Mexico, it's people. It means a lot to me. Um, la, la, la clave de mi corazón, like it's the key to my heart. So I get out of school, I'm an English major. I had some Spanish exposure. And, um, and the first thing that I do when I get out is I start cold calling into a radio station, a local radio station. It was an all news AM format radio station. And I called on that radio station because I figured the audience that was listening to this all news format in Dallas was going to be a pretty sophisticated audience. And I figured if I was in front of businesses, then I could compel them that that type of audience is somebody they would want to advertise to. So I had this idea that I could go sell for this radio station based on some of those assumptions. And I get the interview and I'm telling you this and I'll get to the deal but I want to hopefully inspire people um, and let them know what it was like back in my day when I was walking uphill in the snow, both ways to school. So I get this interview at this radio station and um, my hair is like down to here. My collar, I, I wore a suit and tie for the first 10 years of my career. So I go to the interview and in and, and, and a tie and a suit, but my collar doesn't button. I don't have a shirt that fits me that well. And the sales manager was like, what, what are you doing here? You know, like your hair is too long. You, you're not dressed properly. You can't even button the top button. And I said, I have your programming memorized. Okay. This ties back to theater. I was pretty good at memorizing scripts. I said, I have your programming, programming memorized. I'm a big fan of your station. I think the all news format bodes really well for, um, not only the audience, but for businesses as, as an advertising platform. Um, so I can take you from 6 a.m. to midnight, Monday through Sunday, all of your programming. I'll start right now with the morning team, if you don't mind. And I rattled off all the hosts of each time segment for each day. And the guy was like, who the hell are you? <laughs> okay, you, you know, you can stay in my office. He calls his manager and he said, hey, Bob, get down here. You got to meet this kid. Um, so Bob comes down and he was like, what's going on? He was like, hey, do that thing that you just did do the whole programming memorized thing. And so I look up, I'm in that chair. I look up at the guy and I rattle off Monday through Sunday until it stopped me by like Wednesday, their full programming lineup. <clears throat> I wanted the job, right? I called him for two weeks straight, three times a day to get that moment in that seat. And the, the guy um, pulls out, Bob pulls out two quarters from his pocket. He says, open up your hand. He puts 50 cents in my pocket. He said, this will go towards your draw. You're hired. I'm like, sweet. Okay. So I get into the seat of this job at this local radio station. They put me away from everybody else. And the same guy that came down that gave me the 50 cents towards my offer, the, the GM of sales, has three phone books like stacked this high. And he drops them on my cubicle desk and he says, hit the phones. I'll fire you as quickly as I hired you. Make something happen. And I was like, oh, wow. All right, game on. I did that for like five months, six months. I was like, I'm just going to go and prove that I can do this. I can sell these local radio spots. I can do some sponsorships around Texas Rangers to be hosted the Texas Rangers on that radio station. And I'm, I'm going to prove that I can do this. I can beat the plan. I can cover my draw and they're not going to fire me. And I'm going to use it as a springboard. And I did that to get into Spanish language television. I landed a big job, arguably way too early at Univision. That was my first, I would say kind of real job, right? A few months after college, I get there um, after the radio station experience and I get into Univision, 800 pound gorilla in the Spanish language media space, growing like crazy as is the, the population um, around the Spanish language segment. And I really appreciated that opportunity. I'm a national account executive. I'm in downtown Dallas. I've got a TV in my office. I have an assistant. And I just think I interviewed really well, but out kicked my coverage. And I'm in this job and I'm, I'm uh, represent the network on a national level and have an opportunity 
to work with advertising agencies, but we commanded 90% plus of the eyeballs in, in the United States. And, um, and it was more order taking than what I kind of was accustomed to, which was great, but I didn't find it, you know, despite the great training and all that, I didn't find it to be really challenging. Right. I found myself to get, getting kind of bored. So after 18 months, um, I get this opportunity with a network out of Mexico that wanted to come to the United States, export their content and compete with Univision, like very low single digit audience share at best. And they looked at me and said, Hey, look, you can open our Dallas office and, and prove that out, open other offices. And like, let's, let's go. You want to compete with Univision and try to, you know, capture a market. And I said, a thousand percent, this is more built for me. So I'm in the seat at like 25 and some change. I'm a VP. Um, I'm a player coach and I'm in this seat with like two, 3% audience share in the Spanish language television market, a startup of sorts conglomerate out of Mexico here in the U S and we got to work and my first seven figure deal was shortly after starting. I would stay, I would stay there for five years. So, but like in the first year or two, I do my first seven figure deal. It's one of the largest airlines in the world. Okay. Here we, we're getting into the deal. Okay. Yeah. And this is basically like entrepreneurship at this point too, because you're kind of growing this thing for from sure. the ground up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, and I'm taking some of the training from Univision. I'm, you know, taking some of that experience and everything else. And just that kind of raw hustle grind that I, I feel like is fairly natural to me and putting that all together in a blender. And I got an opportunity to get in front of one of the largest airlines in the world. And I got a seat at the table. And so before I had this kind of ultimate seat at the table, um, I, I did a ton of research. I, I just, it was just kind of in my nature, I, I think being an English major, but I did a ton of research and, um, and to just to, to yeah. interrupt at this point, are you, you know, are you doing search on every fortune 1000 company in America here or you know, how did you kind of approach this and, and how did this all begin? Yeah. So I would, I would take the accounts that were headquartered in my section of the country, let's call it Tola at the time. And I would tier them out. We're definitely targeting fortune 500 Forbes 2000, but I would tier them out and try to prioritize them based on, you know, some indicators of propensity to spend, to advertise. Most of these companies have, you, you would assume kind of national advertising budgets. And, um, and so they would be likely targets, but I would also look at other quantitative and qualitative characteristics of the companies to help, help me kind of prioritize and tier the accounts. Um, and they're all for the most part, publicly traded companies. So I printed a ton uh, on all of them and we used that information to help me prioritize who was probably falling into an ICP, right? Um, so that I could manage my time and manage my energy towards, towards the most likely targets based on my assumptions and qualification. Does that make sense? For sure. Yeah. And so okay. it'd be great to kind of visualize how that went and how you prepared and then what, what happened next? Yeah. So I, based on the research, you know, for the airline, it's, it's butts and seat. But they also, I had uncovered this metric that they were looking for individuals who were willing and able to fly six times per year each. That was like the magic number. And so I got into, I think a lot of things that affected their top line, a lot of things that affected their bottom line, how they mitigated risk, all of that. And when, you know, I was talking to the agency that represented them. It was kind of similar to the radio station story. I just came with this flood of information that I felt like was a separator for me. You know, it wasn't about me representing this network or this product or this solution. It was more about I'm maniacally obsessed and focused on this brand, this company, and I know how they make money. I know how they lose money. I know the risk areas that they have in the market and, um, and that earned the right for sure. Interesting. And, and so them. how did you end up yeah. turning that research into insights that they actually hadn't considered? And what was that like eureka moment? What did that look like when you actually connected the dots there to butts and seats and what they could do with you? 
Yeah, so I, I, it was me just taking a connection between this this you know metric, and there were other ones, but this that's the one that kind of burnt in in my head. And then when I had you know regurgitated that or presented you know that kind of impact um, of an individual that would fly six times per year, um, I, you know, I made a connection that I did have that in my audience, and I had that in specific areas of my audience, and here was the data to support that. And therefore, um, you know, it was it was going to be a smart choice to invest. And so this company um, goes and makes a seven figure investment in a network that is just emerging in the United States with like two or three percent audience share. They sponsor every soccer game. We hosted part of La Liga Mexicana, which is a very popular soccer league out of Mexico. It's awesome. They sponsored our games of that and sponsored that we broadcast at every corner kick. So anytime a corner kick and I you know, had worked with the team to say, can I do this? Can, can we flash their logo during every corner kick? I don't know much about soccer, but that's a pretty fun part of the game to watch. And the, the company's like, yeah, we could do that. I was like logo and everything. And then the announcer will say that this is sponsored by the air. Yes, we'll do that. I'm like, okay, cool. So I packaged that in and then at halftime during the halftime show, could we revisit the brand and have the logo up there during some portion of the halftime show? So corner kicks and halftime show. And the network is like, yes, we can. What do you think roughly we're going to get in return? I'm like, it'll be seven figures. They're like, yes, you can. I was like, all right, sweet. So went and represented it. They signed off on it and it was a great moment. Yeah. Well, look, that theater major came in handy when you were framing up the drama of what that TV yeah. program would look like and what would make an impact. Um, that's how we'll justify it. See, but, uh, yeah, I knew, I knew the whole, I knew the whole time the combo of all that was going to work out. I had no idea, but yeah, it was, it was definitely helpful. I think. Yeah, no, exactly. And obviously, closing seven figures. I don't care what it is you're selling is a pretty huge moment. And it has a big impact on your ability, your understanding of what's possible, what you can do. And so, how did it feel for you to? kind of close a deal of that size or that importance early in your career? And are there any lessons that you actually took away from that experience that shaped you moving forward? Yeah. I mean, I, so it was, it was very gratifying. I, I, I felt like I had, you know, done well in the first couple of years on commissions and things like that, but this was, this was a bigger moment for sure. And, you know, it's a, just a bigger payoff that says, Hey, look, if you put in this kind of effort and you really prepare to win and you become a student of, you know, um, of, of, of the customers, the prospects, and you take a diligent, uh, organized approach to your energy, to your time, and separate yourself from everyone else that's in the job, you know, I would say in, in, in a way that is, is powerful and differentiating, then you can have a big impact. The outputs and the results of that can be powerful, right? So I, I, it's just, I, I realized as much or assumed as much rather here was the realization and um, it was inspiring. And I'm like, okay, I can support my family. And um, uh, we started a family early in my career. And so I had multiple um, pieces of motivation. And I was like, this is, this is something I'm going to stick with for sure. Yeah. And no, I, of course. And I think, you know, to all the folks that you lead today, they might be sitting there thinking, Alex is here in his ivory tower. How can he give me feedback? He doesn't know what it's like to be the young sales rep anymore. And to them, I say, look what happened here. Yeah, it, there's there's quite a few examples of that. And there's also examples of me falling flat on my face. I mean, I got into leadership early in my career, right? I'm a player coach. I'm working on these bigger deals for sure. Um, but I'm also at the same time, I'm recruiting folks. I'm developing folks. I'm trying to execute in the field. I'm making tons of mistakes. So the wins are great. But I also have plenty of failures and losses that I just tried not to repeat. But once I got into that leadership motion, and, and really that was just kind of caused by my natural gravitation towards that opportunity and raising my hand. And I also think that, you know, the companies early in my career were like, can you teach what you're doing here? And can you also do the most important job of the leadership role, which is recruit the right people? Absolutely. I know that probably gave you that taste for the big stage. Of course, there was a lot of evolution and progression to where you are today and a lot of different roles there. And so just to even fast forward from there, I know that there was another seminal deal that you kind of thought about later in your career that represented something that was really important to you or made a big impact. 
would be interesting to talk a little bit about what roles you had seen in between and, and kind of what led you to that next point um, to where you were. Okay. So if you combine the vision in Azteca America, which is where smaller audience um, going up against the big, the big players and, and where I did that seven figure deal, the seven years, I'm seven years in Spanish language broadcast television. I'm like, that's awesome. That's amazing. But you know, we're rounding the decade hitting 2010 and I'm like, I've got to go digital. I really appreciate this experience. Appreciate the leadership opportunity. I've got to go digital. So let me find a dot com or similar and, um, and see if I can cut over. And so careerbuilder.com at the time was a top 25.com Super Bowl advertiser. LinkedIn and Indeed are slowly kind of creeping on the scene to disrupt their core product and disrupt the company. But that was a really cool experience. I went there as a leader and it's new for me. It's a new space. The, the, if, if folks are from Chicago or if they know career builder from the past, like that was an elite sales culture. They were hell bent on training and development and had, had these robust investments in their, their sales, their sales teams and their talent. And so it was one of those places where, um, you know, I got a ton of like vocabulary against what I was previously doing, right? If I was unconsciously competent or incompetent before, now I'm consciously becoming competent to a degree in understanding where my strengths and weaknesses are by having, you know, vo vocab against the methodology and, and, and all of that stuff that, um, was, I guess was effective. So anyways, I'm there. Um, I do that for three and a half years, great experience. And I'm reflecting on my career and I'm like, I don't have a problem. I, I think in earning and, in, in, you know, making things happen as a leader, as an IC, I need to go venture back. Um, I want to, I want to try to swing for the fences and go venture back. So I joined a series a, we went through series C out of New York. I, I met one of the greatest CEOs, people, uh, still a, a great friend of mine, Joe Essenfeld. And I'm with him um, as an early employee. We're building out Jive. It would later be acquired. Uh, amazing people. He's awesome. And I, I get a phone call saying, hey, there's this guy named Carlos De La Torre in this company called MongoDB. I don't know if you'll get this job, but you should go meet this guy, Carlos. This is a recruiter out of Texas um, who's awesome, Tony Bechera. Um, He's changed many, many lives here in Texas and beyond. And he was kind of, he kind of knew how to get at me a little bit. He's like, I don't know if you can get this job, but I think I can broker a meeting. And so I get to MongoDB and this story about this deal is not so much about a big grandiose seven figure deal. So for the folks that are listening or watching, here's one that, um, I think is, is critical, not because of its size, but just because of, of, um, how impactful it was at, for the company and improving what it proved. All right. So I'm at MongoDB. I'm a leader at MongoDB. I'm in the first line role. Um, I would become second line, but I'm in the first line role. I came into the team. I had to make some changes nearly immediately. And it's just kind of me in this office and in, in Dallas, not this one right here, but I'm in an office and then I've got a brilliant solution architect in Austin who had been with the company. This is early 2015. I think as a company, we'll have to check this. It's like 30 or 40 million in revenue. Um, David Achiria, incredible. Uh, I could go on and on about him and Carlos. He comes in as CEO, you know, in the previous year within the last 12 months. I'm there early 2015, right on the heels of Carlos joining. And um, they made a bunch of changes. It was time to just go to market in an elite, excellent way. And, uh, and I'm just surrounded by these amazing people in this world-class enablement, first delivery of force management, all this stuff is kind of happening, but Carlos signs me up for this number and I've got to go hit a number. And, um, there's a company out of San Antonio, um, mind you MongoDB for the folks that don't know that's, that's an open source database. And at this time in 2015, um, there was very little functional difference between the open source version of the database and the closed source enterprise version that we were responsible for selling. So you talk about like swinging a weighted bat. Um, it was, it was difficult. It was challenging, but 
we didn't care. We felt like for sure this was a massive TAM to go attack. It was ripe for disruption. The legacy incumbent players of a tabular SQL type database model, that was old news. Here we are with a modern approach to, um, to being a data platform. And, uh, and we had robust enablement. So we were just out to knock down doors in the market. I get in front of this company in Texas who has a managed service offering of the open source version of the database. So they're a competitor, right? Um, the way that it was licensed, there were businesses that could form around this open source database and they could wrap services and security and all that good stuff. And there's this mission critical application, a couple of mission critical applications that are running. Um, we got a little bit of forensics um, to understand that this, these applications were running on, on, on our database, um, PG'd into there um, and got some meetings. And this is an environment at that company where they certainly could run this application, support this application and in the instances of MongoDB by themselves on their own. Right, this group could go across the hall and make that happen, um, but we uh, we got him. We <laughs> we got him six <laughs> figures, right? Not a million, but six figures. And the CEO Dave was like, "This is a seminal deal in our history." Yeah, well, I mean, it's fascinating because obviously it's a sensitive deal. It's a sensitive customer. They had a team working on it who could lose face if they decide to go with you. Right. So there's, there's politics. And I think everyone knows there's a lot of politics that go on behind the scenes and anything like this. Um, you know, there's obviously spending money on something. There's almost kind of a, a sense of admitting defeat a little bit, even though it's not the main team doing that. You know, did you go on site to kind of broker that where they come into you? How did you navigate that sensitivity around those blockers and challenges there? Yeah, there, there was we very much we went on site. Um, it, we needed to do anything and everything that we could to have like a seat at the table and try to find some sort of advantage, right? Um, and and so I would, you know, I would I would be I was able to book meetings with the person who was responsible for supporting the environment and running, you know, the the application, um, which again was mission critical to the company. So here I am, kind of back what's kind of in my dna which is okay what does this mean to the business what is the business trying to solve for top line bottom line risks all of that okay cool let me find an attachment to you know what happens if, if, if this application goes down what happens if there's you know some sort of breach or you know anything like that um then what does that do to the business and you know it's kind of like the fear of loss over the opportunity of gain right i'm playing to the amygdala and I've got this great solution architect that's with me. And um, there's a bunch of really smart people in the room. I have no idea what they're saying as far as the technical depth of the features and functions that need to be covered and the critical capabilities. But I'm, I'm learning as we go along and, um, and I'm making sure to continue to attach to the business in that type of positioning and saying, saying you know, in front of them and hustling. And Yeah, well, I mean, I just have a taste for the dramatic and I'm thinking in my head, and of course, you like to dramatize what it is that you do. And so I'm out here thinking, you know, you're having secret meetings inside the facility here that shut out the other team who's actually working on the product. And, uh, you know, there's like this competitive aspect to it about the battlefield out there and vanquishing that foe and talking about it internally. We finally beat them. We basically just killed them. And so that's what's really funny about picturing this one is it really kind of represents a lot of those things, even, even though it's a bunch of cubicles. Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I felt that way about it. Um, you know, I was like, this is an incredible proving ground. And, um, and yeah, it mattered to me. It was, it was just, it was massive. It was massive. And it wasn't because of the deal size. It was just like proving that we could, we could win in that type of set of circumstances. What, what kinds of lessons did you yourself learn here, you know, that you took into the future, whether in Mongo or elsewhere and, 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 what, why was that proving ground so important to you working there? Like, what did you kind of take from that? I, I mean, I didn't know, I didn't know about MongoDB. Again, this is like, this is, this is early. This is two and a half years prior to the IPO. And I didn't know about Carlos and Dave and this, this lineage and this unbelievable legacy and history across all of these people that originated back at PTC, you know, down through Blade Logic, BMC, that, that whole crew. I mean, I didn't know them. Right. And, um, 
And so I uh, was not short on confidence and I come into this environment thinking, you know, I'm hot stuff. And <laughs> I mean, was I was I was I was humbled um, whether I showed it or not. I mean, I was surrounded by really elite um, folks who, um, you know, were extremely driven like me. And I had an opportunity to learn so much. Um, and so, you know, doing deals like this in that environment, surrounded by those folks, it's super high stakes because we were not shy that we wanted to build the company in such an excellent elite way that we could qualify for, you know, raising money on a, on a public market and, you know, have, have high growth. I think we, we were, you know, McKinsey grow fast or die slow type of thinkers, right? We wanted to stay above that 60% growth rate, get to a 60% growth rate. Once we hit north of hundred million, do that. We were eight times more likely to hit a billion dollar run rate based on that study. And we just all wrapped our arms around this idea of, um, operating in a, in a really, um, you know, elite way. I use that word a lot. Um, and what would come out of it. So it was nice to be able to contribute. Nice to be able to say we could win even in the face of a competitor. And yeah, so it was validating in a, in a number of ways. Yeah. Well, you talk about that culture or that lineage, not everyone had the boldness and courage to sharpen their chops at places like Univision, Azteca America, the radio stations. Okay. So you have a more unique, yeah. unique path there for sure. And I don't know. I think one thing that is really interesting hearing a lot of these stories, um, there's a really common theme in a lot of these cases where you talk about this company's going public and this company needed to prove itself. And a lot of the folks we talked to were not at a place in their career like you are right now or like they were today, where they were that highest level leader. And I think a lot of people get stuck and think, why does this really matter beyond on a personal level? But of course, most, most people like you look back and are just like, to your point, I had an opportunity to contribute and actually every single one of those makes a huge difference. So I think that is an interesting takeaway yeah. even for me. Yeah. Yeah. I was, you know, it's high stakes environments, right? Like high stakes environments, very intense. Um, you know, we've got to be able to prove that we can grow at a, at a certain rate. We know that if we do that, there's it's, the manifestations of success are probably going to be great. Um, and you know, there's just pressure from, all sorts of areas, but I've, I found that, you know, you, you hear this like pain plus reflection is growth. Learning is in the struggle. It, it is, it is true. You know, there's times where you want to tap out and, um, and, and perhaps for some, that's the right situation. It's all good. I'm not, I'm not judging that. But, um, for, for me, I'm like, I'm going to stay in this fight. I didn't know these folks. Um, I'm going to take in as much of this as I can and try to grow and evolve. Um, and see how that, you know, how that works itself out. And, and it was, it was great. We, we, you know, we IPO to stay for a year after that. And, um, I, you know, I've got this, this, um, circle of folks that I experienced that with, and I, I, I can't hold them in higher regard than I do now. It's fantastic. Experience. Absolutely. Well, I mean, on that topic, you're talking about, the different things you learned at various stages of your career, whether it was through leading or through being led by others. And you and I have kind of talked about this before that it's really hard to copy and paste. And I think it's probably where a lot of people get into trouble and you got to go take the best of each approach. And, you know, you've just made a recent move, of course, where I'm sure you're thinking about this on a day-to-day -day basis on how do I lead here? So how do you kind of distill the best components and avoid those pitfalls or, or what are the mistakes that other folks make when they do make them? And, and then lastly, kind of what are the non-negotiables that you do take with you? Yeah, I think that there is um, there are examples of folks that try to imitate or try to copy and paste playbooks like for like and um, and they kind of park the situational um uh, stuff that's around them and think that just like for like, they can come into a situation and do what they did from a previous company or they kind of fashion themselves after some other leader and that style and that intensity. And they try to bring that. And, um, and, and I, I don't, I don't, I, I would caution against that. Right. Um, the situational awareness really matters, really coming in and understanding your environment internally, externally, um, you know, it, it, it matters. So I, I'm conscious of that. The next job that I would go to, 
was um, a step up for me. Um, and in terms of like, you know, title and scope, and that was a proving ground for me to go out and build out a business and take the stuff that I had learned across all the crazy <laughs> industries that I had been um, uh, as, as, as a seller and a sales leader and just, Hey, now I've got an opportunity to, to, um, to build something, taking those experiences and being informed by those. So, but yeah, like for like transfers, I don't think they work that well. As you mentioned, there are some things that are transferable. Um, and I can get into that if, if you want me to, you want me to? No, we'd love for you to get into that. And I, I think that, right. Everybody, every leader has a few things that they take with them here and there where people start saying, this is where they sound like a broken record, right? You, you got to repeat something to yeah. be annoying about it. If it's worth saying once, it's worth saying many times. So yeah, I would love to understand a little bit about what you do take with you and what those things are for you that people would probably complain about. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so I I, I mean, look, there, this is, this man needs no further advertisements, but you know, this, this book has all the answers to the test. Editor's note, Alex is showing the book, The Qualified Sales Leader by John McMahon. Um, I was just fortunate to be surrounded by him and others and got kind of the real life uh, in the streets version of those teachings. Um, I, that was very informative. Career Builder was very informative. The time during my television days was very informative, right? When I was unconsciously making things happen. Um, but look, it, as a leader, the most important thing that you can do, and you'll hear this a lot, is it's who over what? Who over what? Who are you surrounding yourself with? Um, so. The ability to to identify and attract top talent and have plans to assess the strengths and weaknesses of that talent and develop against the areas that you can develop and, and retain that top talent and go out and execute in the field. That that's it. Recruit, develop, execute. That was that was really drilled into my head during the time at MongoDB. And it's a thousand percent true. Who over what team matters, talent matters. You can have third or fourth place product and have the best folks surrounding you who are eager to grow or eager to, to, to learn and earn and get after it and capture an unfair share. And they will, I promise, run circles around the first place product, guaranteed. Um, and I've, I've experienced that before a couple of times and it's just fascinating. So as a leader, that matters. But there's five categories that I, that I, I think are really critical for sellers and it kind of rolls up to sales leaders as well. These are five pillars of focus of mastery. Mastery of pipeline generation. It's the hardest part of the job, but um, you've got to be able to fill the top of the funnel, okay? There's a lot that falls underneath each of these five pillars, so I'm going to go through them quickly. Mastery of messaging. Really having command over your message, understanding what matters to the buyer, how you map that to the sales process, how to definitively you know, separate yourself from competition, understand your differentiation, how to attach to the, the biggest business problems. Trap setting is an incredible skill that falls under mastery of messaging as well, influencing decision criteria. Um, there's mastery of qualification. Um, MedPIC, I think, is a great methodology for qualification. There are others, but I think that one is, um, is very, very strong. And then there's mastery of your accounts. So the actual tiering and prioritization of your accounts based on an ICP and, and having a very smart approach to that prioritization of time, tearing out your territory, being able to manage the territory. If you're responsible for the Americas, for example, it's, um, it's really powerful to understand the Forbes 2000 cohort, the Fortune 500 cohort, and understand where, um, where you have opportunity based on ICP. And then down through the leaders, down through the ICs, prioritizing where you're gonna spend your time and the return on that. And then finally, um, mastery of delivering an accurate forecast. You, you get into those five pillars and the key competencies around those, they're pretty well transferable, I would say. Yeah, well, I can already vision the slide that you created when you came in and uh, made everyone read ad nauseum about those things. And to be fair, right? Like I said, it's if it's worth saying once, it's worth saying it again. And so um, I can imagine there's there's plenty to get into when it gets to those, that's just the highest level. Yeah, for sure. There's, there's a lot underneath them. And like I said, if I, if there's anything that's wisdomatic that's coming across here, um, I'm, I'm, I, my credit is to other folks that I've, I've learned from for sure. Um, I just, I, I, in all seriousness, when I would hear this stuff, like 
you know, some I would take and transform and make it my own. But when, when I was surrounded by these people, um, I, I was very determined to not just memorize, but put into practice these, these, these kind of gifts of, of knowledge and skills and all that development that, you know, were being offered across these different opportunities in my career. I, I just, what did you say? I write it down. Um, I've got to, you know, discover a library of all these things that I could go and use. And I was fortunate to have leaders who really challenged me when I didn't know what the hell I was talking about to call me out and make sure that the knowledge was truly validated as transfer of the skill was truly transferred to me. And I'm, I'm grateful for that too. Well, is there, is there anything as you think back two or three decades now, and you talked about learning from people, is there anything that you were told two. throughout let's or be, that you thought clear, that two, you not, would, not three. It, yeah, fair enough. Is there anything that <laughs> uh, you learned throughout that or that you were told or that you once believed was true to be successful at your job that you are now allergic to, right? So you just talked about the things you adopted, but is there anything that you basically looked at and said, that is not how I want to be, or those are not the things I want to do? Yeah. So I, I'll tell you this, like the, the most famous CEOs and CROs in the world. Um, I don't, I don't know many of them. I've studied them as best I can. I've been exposed to some of them. Thank goodness. None of them are perfect. They're all as far as I can understand human. Therefore they're fallible. <laughs> like, so you got to give grace. Like, you know, um, everyone talks about this, the tactical empathy, um, down, you know, through, through the ranks of a company as a leader, you got, you have to, to employ tactical empathy. And I agree, but just realize that if you've got leadership above you, that that empathy should go in that direction too. Cause that person, um, is probably very, very capable, but there's fallibility just by law of averages. Right. So one of the things that I'm conscious of, I've been in these very intense militaristic environments, um, which I'm okay with. I'm okay with, um, but there, I think there is some dials and some knobs to turn uh, with that intensity. Um, what I found is, you know, folks who have an incredible amount of drive, um, probably are already bearing the weight of the world on their own shoulders, looking at themselves in the mirror, going homes to their family or friends or partners, and, um, probably have the stuff in the back of their head about you know, wanting to prove that they can do what they can do, they can provide in the way that they need to provide. And so, you know, you gotta, you gotta be able to tailor to folks and understand why they're doing what they're doing. Why, what's the big personal and professional set of whys that somebody has tap into that, meet them where they are. And there there's, um, there's modulating intensity that I've found, you know, uh, I'm, I'm super conscious of that now more so than ever and understanding what resonates with this person versus this person. And um, th those experiences inform that perspective. Well, I'm interested in that realm. It kind of brings up two thoughts as you were talking there, which is number one, is there anything you remember in particular that spurred on that realization um, of how you, how know, you change your own perspective? You, yes. Well, and, yeah. then, and then number two, I think one of the, the, the topics that people often talk about when they talk about the militaristic environments and these really hard um, places where folks have to grind first is, you know, they got to earn the opportunity and they got to get those learnings. If you are not militaristic and if you put people in a different environment and all we can, you know, teach people is what we know, how do you ensure that they get those same experiences still, or they get those same learnings, even if it's in a different way? Well, I, I think that there's, there's a couple of things here, like, you know, leadership, leadership style matters. It does, it does matter, you know, and, there is a way to gain commitment rather than compliance when you really connect with people on their whys, right? I had somebody who worked for me, Mike Ernest, who was just masterful at this. And, in, you know, I, I think one of the beautiful things about, we didn't talk about Zscaler, but one of the beautiful things about Zscaler was I come in at a pretty high level and then get promoted. So I go from third line to leading the Americas, which would become over half of the, the, the company's business. But I come in to this group that's reporting into me, they're extremely talented um, and they do these things really well. And I was so fortunate to be able to learn from them, you know, and, and I'm not shy about describing that or admitting that, but, you know, connecting with people 
on why they're doing what they're doing. So the reality is if you're in this, if you're in this game of enterprise sales, for example, it's fiercely competitive, it's high stakes, it's a professional arena. There are other jobs that you can do that don't have, you know, the intensity that comes along with that. I mean, if you've looked at these coaches in professional sports, for example, and I do think the sports analogies apply extremely well, I hope well, that and helps it's something, a lot. Yeah, for sure. And I, this is a topic that recently came up in the media. And for those folks who follow any degree of college or professional football, they would know who Nick Saban is. And, um, you know, as we're recording this podcast, there was a game recently where, you know, they were having a close game and he screamed at a player on the sideline. And after the game, the player in the press conference basically said, yeah, look, he kind of knows how to press the right buttons for me. And I know he cares about me. Yeah. And so it kind of stirred up this big media debate around, does Nick Saban yell at players too much? And is this an old man who's treating people poorly? And I think really what kind of came out of it from some of the interviews that you're know, talking to folks was he actually understands me a lot more than your average young coach. And he knows how to dial yeah. those different buttons of specific players. He's not going to do that to someone who he does not think is going to motivate. That's right. So, so Nick has a um, coach Saban, coach Nick, whatever we call, it, I don't know him that well. He has that connection. He has that intimate understanding. He knows how to meet his players where they're at. He knows how to tailor it. And, um, and that's, and, and more than anything, he cares, he cares personally about them. And those players know that. So does radical candor, Kim Malone Scott or Nick Saban or watch Greg Popovich, who had an incredible connection, probably one of the greatest coaches of all time with his folks. And my goodness, were they intense with each other? Does that mean that you have the license to go and hijack radical candor and, you know, get after people or be like Nick Saban or be like Greg Popovich or be like Kim Malone Scott? Not necessarily. No, like, you know, um, but understand the, um, the, the methods that are available to you, but more than anything, caring about people and, um, and being in a position to challenge them directly for their benefit, for their growth. And having the license to do that through your rapport is a really powerful thing. If you're working for me or you're working in my org, you're not going to be in a position where I'm going to dress you down and embarrass you in front of a group of people. That's just, I've seen that. I've seen it many times. I think there is, uh, there's another way to connect with folks. There's another way to set examples and to allow people to learn through a struggle, through a difficult experience. And that's just the kind of things that are, you know, you've got to, you got to be aware of, right. There's just certain places that you don't, you know, you don't behave in certain ways and, and, and that's, that's okay. I'm going to, one last comment. It's, it is, um, it is a professional, I'm going to reiterate this. It's a professional arena doing this. It's high rewards to, you know, a proportionately high stakes environment. And so you got to sign up for that. And I think right now, you know, the ability to be resilient, and to tap into your why and have that drive matters because I think we've got a crowd of people that are backing away from the difficulty, the struggle, and that is where the growth is. And I think there's a great population of folks that are coming up right now, break through that difficulty, hang in there, put it all into perspective because there's, there's just so much development that comes from those, those tough experiences. Absolutely. And look, I guess one thing I'd follow up with here, and we can talk a little bit about multiverse if you just want to spend a minute on that big career move you just made. But related to that, as much as I love a, a tasty bit of thought leadership, um, it's always great to get into how does this actually work in practice. And so, you know, you just moved to lead sales um, at a really exciting company, multiverse. You talked about tapping into the whys. You talked about learning about your people. Are there specific ways? that you actually go find those things out? Do you have a litany of questions that you ask people every time you meet them? How do you actually go about finding that stuff? I, 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 would, I would really like to understand how people came up, like formative years to me is, is a good starting place. You know, I, I do it when, when I interview and I like to just understand how, where folks are coming from. Um, and so that, you know, understanding that I, I think it's just great influence, motivation, you know, information as a leader that I can gather if I understand where folks are coming from and why they're doing what they're doing. Like, why are you in this job? You know, what matters to you? Tell me about, 
tell me about what steers that, right? Understanding people's motivations and their whys is really powerful. And I, I think being able to go back into childhood years, starting there, I do it myself. I'll describe for people just, you know, so that they're comfortable. Like, this is what it was like for me with, with my mom, with my dad, with my siblings and, and, um, and, you know, let them be comfortable and understanding my story. And then they share theirs that that to me is a good starting point. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's hard. You don't have time to spend with every single person, but hopefully you get those high quality interactions and everyone's metal gets tested in due time. But just related to that, if you just want to spend a quick minute, I am curious, you've had a lot of very high powered sales leadership roles. You just talked about that Zscaler, obviously an incredible company that's, that's done extremely well that you're joining an earlier stage company, Multiverse. I would love to understand just really in brief what you're so excited about there. What's motivating you now to, to make that move? Yeah, sure. Um, so again, it's, it's, you know, there's two publicly traded companies in MongoDB and, and in Zscaler. Um, I, I found those markets to be really interesting. I think the market opportunity that, that I'm in now is, is, is not, I think, I know is similar to where I was at Udacity. Udacity was in between MongoDB and Zscaler. Um, that was another situation where I had an opportunity to meet someone like Dolly. I'm doing well at Udacity. The company's doing well. And, um, and I, I, I get this message from Dolly and, you know, how, how, how cool is that? That, that was life-changing for sure, you know, to go to Zscaler, to come out of Zscaler, you know, ran a very large org, very large business surrounded by incredible people, awesome experience. And here I am in a space where, you know, the supply chain for talent in the United States and abroad is completely broken. It is a math problem that is just not solvable. The world um, has a demand for um, skill sets across different domains, different industries that we simply are not producing enough supply for, right? And then you've got um, this wave of automation and artificial intel intelligence that is uh, rendering some of these human skills obsolete. So you've got a threat of obsolescence, you've got uh, massive skills gaps, right? And then You've got the machines, Skynet, <laughs> um, Terminator reference. Look, it's all it's all happening. So, so what what needs to um, what needs to happen? Well, we have an opportunity to upskill, reskill folks, and provide even provide folks their segments of the population that don't have the the access to funds to go to a university and get a degree. That model is incredibly broken. I've got a daughter who's eighteen. That it's about to go to college, and um, I, I just I do not understand how these schools think they can command what they're asking for um, in terms of tuition. And I'm just baffled and laughing because I went on college tours last week, and it's just like it's insanity. Well, my daughter is fortunate because I think I might help fund her going to college, right? As long as she can lay out a strong ROI and not major in underwater basket weaving or English, like she's good, I'll help her pay for college. But that is an extreme luxury. And even then, if you're coming out of, out of four-year university right now, how relevant is that experience going to be? I think it's a powerful experience, but it certainly begs the question. Um, and who qualifies and is able to go and get that type of education? And how relevant is that now to employers? Well. It's not, it's not as relevant as it used to be. And it's not equitable because there's amazing talent out there and underrepresented under segments in really difficult environments that they come up with that don't have access to the university and frankly don't have access and exposure to these corporate opportunities. We solve for, for that, for placing early talent in an apprenticeship model into, um, uh, into companies. We upskill and reskill existing employees in an apprenticeship model across software engineering tracks, data tracks, business transformation tracks. And um, we're helping to fix this broken supply of, of talent and, and, um, and you know, skills obsolescence. That's, that's what we're doing. It's a big market. It's a big commercial opportunity. It's the right thing to do. So it's mission driven, you know, to go out and affect the world. I care about solving for this problem and Multiverse um, has done a phenomenal job and, and I'm excited to contribute to the next chapter of growth. Yeah, it's a worthy mission and you're biting off a pretty big chunk. 
but uh but i think those are the most inspiring ones and that inspire people to actually come over and 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 rally around folks like you who to your point need to go recruit them so really uh really incredible and super excited to see what happens there i guess just to close out here we talk a lot about these career defining experiences you've mentioned some people that have had a big impact on you people are at the core of everything i know you don't want to leave anyone out as most people don't but um but who are a few of those leaders and mentors that have really impacted your career and if you have any stories or, or kind of anecdotes that reflect one or two of those would be really interesting to hear. I'll, I'll call out Carlos and, and um, there, yeah, it's hard to do this, man, because there's so many men and women that have, have had an impact on me and I wasn't the most coachable. This might be the understatement of the podcast. I wasn't the most coachable person as I was coming up and uh, you know, my heart goes out to leadership that, um, you know, had me on their team, but I cared, I cared a lot, but okay. So uh, I'll just call out Carlos. Carlos, um, uh, absolutely was the right person to come into MongoDB at that time in that company's, um, uh, a stage and, you know, the ambitions for the next phase of growth, go out and capture the market. Um, and you know, Carlos, um, drove a pace and set an example led from the front around work ethic, around being able to get into the details about being, you know, up here enough to run programs for the company to scale. So not just build, but to scale. You think about operational leadership, deal leadership, people leadership, he could hit all three. And, um, and he called me out. He called me out when I needed to be called out. He, he dopped me right in between the eyes, so to speak, when I needed that. Um, he grabbed me one time, not, not physically, he pulls me aside and, um, he was like, I'll never forget this because I was really passionate about having SDRs in the field office. I didn't want them in some hub. I wanted SDRs in the field office. I wanted to see the progression, the succession be surrounded by AEs. I wanted to see that strive towards it, work closely with them. And, um, he, I come out of this meeting, I make my case. And, um, and he said, you're like, do you, do you know what locking jaw is? Do you know what locking jaw is? And I said, are you talking about like a, like a dog? He was like, bingo, like a pit bull. When if, and he explains it, he's like, when a pit bull goes and bites, they bite and they lock. And there's just like, you're going to need, you know, um, the, the jaws of life to be able to separate that. Right. It's like worse than a vice. He said, you know. You hit a point and you stay on it and, um, and you're like, you're, you're, you got locking jaw. And I didn't want to hear that, but I needed to hear that. Um, and I'll give you one other example of somebody who, who had learned under Carlos, JP Bolin. He runs um, enablement over at Rubrik. He's incredible, incredible leader. And I, he was my leader at MongoDB for some time. And we were going through the intricacies of the database terminology and he could tell that I didn't understand a word that was being used. This is about um, um, provisioning a database. And he's going through it. He's on the whiteboard and I'm on the whiteboard and he pauses and he's like, do you know what I mean? Do you know what you mean when you say provision in the context of a database? And I didn't. And if he had not done that, it might may seem like a minor thing, but as an example of a great leader of like staying in that moment, confirming that the principle, the lesson, the skill was transferred, it landed, and that I could play it back. Right. Um, so there's a couple of examples of impactful leaders. Yeah. No. And that, to that last point, it's, uh, most people don't want to admit when they don't know something and if it's minor anyways, who really cares? And so I think that lesson is actually really impactful and a really interesting one to go out on um, as we talk about kind of all these different stages of learning throughout our lives is probably to not be too arrogant to ask the really dumb questions um, to ensure we're kind of getting that progression throughout. Yeah. But, uh, but thank yeah, you so I much, agree. Alex, for your time. And this was awesome. Michael, thank you. I enjoyed it. A lot of fun. All right, man. Take care. Thanks, as always, for joining us on another episode of The Windwire. We'd appreciate it if you could share it on LinkedIn, Twitter, and rate us or leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Helps others discover the show and join our growing community. Our contact info is in the show notes, including our show email, 
You can see all episodes at thewindwire.com and then your favorite podcast player. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode.